Hello, everybody. I'm Bill Bolden, and welcome to the Fuqua School of Business Distinguished Speaker Series. Uh, tonight, uh, assuming you're on East Coast time, uh, whatever time zone you're in, however, uh, we're especially lucky to have as our guest uh, Sean McManus, who is the chairman of CBS Sports. He is literally in two different halls of fame. They, uh, the Broadcasting and Cable Hall of Fame, as well as the Sports Broadcast Hall of Fame, and is the winner, if I've got the count right, of 15 Emmy Awards. Uh, importantly for us, or fortunately for us, I would say, uh, he is also a Duke graduate and a Duke parent with uh, two of his kids currently uh, undergraduates at Duke. And so, Sean, we feel very, very lucky to have you with us tonight. Welcome. Thank you, Bill. Um, I have a obviously a warm spot in my heart for Duke University and the students of Duke University. Um, so I'm pleased to do this. Uh, my kids had a great uh, first semester. My daughter is a junior and she's living off campus and my son lived on campus and he had two classes in person and three uh, remotely. And my daughter was, as you probably could guess, all remote, but they had a really good, uh, really good semester, all things considered. And I know the world is very different now than it has been in the past. So we're all adjusting and my world is professionally, um, I'm sure we'll get into it, but adjusting literally on an hourly basis sometimes with games being rescheduled or postponed or canceled. It's been a year unlike any year that I've had, and I'm sure that's true for pretty much everybody uh, in, the, in, in the world. Yes, with, without a doubt, these are, these are unprecedented times, and, and certainly we'll, we'll get to that. But I want to, I want to bring you back in time a little bit to, uh, to your time at Duke. And so you knew from a very early age that, that the world of sports was, was where you wanted to be. Uh, and you chose to come to Duke. I'm, I'm curious why you chose Duke, um, given at that time, Duke was not that prominent in, in the world of sports. And so what, what was it that brought you to Duke? Well, you're right. I did know at a young age, really when I was about 14 years old, that I wanted to go into sports television because my dad was the, um, the well-known sports commentator, Jim McKay. So I grew up around ABC Sports and live sports television production. Um, and I really, um, Harvard was kind of my first choice, to be honest with you. Um, and I made the waiting list at Harvard and I was told that I would be admitted um, in January if I wanted to. Um, I went down to Duke, which was a very, very close um, second choice. And after two weeks, I called my father up and said, I'm not leaving uh, Duke University. This is where I was meant to be. So it was fortuitous. And I knew that I wanted a good liberal arts education. Uh, communication schools were not really in vogue then. There were very few of them. <clears throat> and since I had so much experience freelancing for ABC Sports, really starting as a, as a 14 year old child, child labor laws um, be damned, I guess. Uh, but I knew what I wanted to do. I had, I had been around productions and I knew that I wanted to be able to communicate well. I knew that I wanted a well-rounded education and Duke for me was the perfect, uh, the perfect choice for that. So, you know, for me, it was a great four years. Um, you're right, it was not the Duke University that it is today, but I got a great education and it prepared me really well for my job in television. So uh, you know, back, back to this idea that you, you knew what you wanted to do at an early age. As I understand it, your parents actually made you take an internship uh, at an investment bank that no longer exists, Solomon Brothers. Tell me, how did that go? It went very well. Um, it was really my mom who said, listen, um, if you want to go into sports television, that's fine with me. She was well familiar with the travel schedule and the, the different kind of lifestyle that you adopted when you uh, went into sports television. She said, listen, just so you pursue all the possible avenues out there, you know you don't want to be a doctor. Um, you know you don't want to be um, um, a stockbroker probably, but you never know unless you give it a shot. And we had a good friend who was a partner at Solomon Brothers, which was one of the most respected firms of the time. This was my uh, my junior year. 
And my mother said, why don't we, you know, call on Mr. Mignotti, who is our friend and have an internship and you, you never know, you might like it. So I had an internship. I was the only intern there uh, who wasn't either in business school or going to business school. And I was a little bit of fish out of water, but I really enjoyed it. And I found it challenging and I found the subject material interesting. And it was a, you know, it was a little bit of a tough decision, but at the end of the summer, I said to my parents, listen, I'm used to the excitement of live television sports production. I think I'm gonna be bored being on Wall Street. I'm gonna miss the action. I'm gonna miss the sports. And I'm glad I did this. It was a wonderful summer, but I really want to, um, I want to go into sports television. But I think my mom was right. If I hadn't done that, um, since many of my friends went into the financial world, I might have always thought, well, maybe that was what my true calling was. But this really confirmed for me that sports television was the, uh, was the career for me to pursue. But it was a good summer. And I, I made some good friends, some of whom I still am in contact with. Um, they all went into, uh, into finance or uh, some kind of banking, and they are very envious of my job, I must say. They look at me and they say, you know, you get to do the Super Bowl and the Final Four and the Masters and all these great events. Do they actually pay you to do this job? And I say they do pay me to do this job, but it's a job that a lot of people would do for free. And whenever I think about retiring, because I'm kind of getting towards that age, you know, I think about what would I do that I would enjoy more than being responsible for some of the great sporting events in the world. So, you know, I, I keep signing new three-year contracts with CBS, now Viacom CBS, and I'm going to go as, you know, probably as long as they'll have me. I may slow down a little bit, but it's, um, it's not a bad gig, I must tell you. Yeah. So, so coming back to your family, uh, Perhaps for some of our uh, participants tonight, they're not as familiar with the name Jim McKay, but truly one of the legendary uh, <clears throat> sports broadcasters, uh, kind of brought the world of sports uh, into homes uh, and the phrase, the thrill of victory, the agony of defeat, uh, mm -hmm. such a, such a well-known catchphrase and a winner of 13 Emmys uh, himself. So, what tell tell me with uh, with Jim McKay? I mean, he he was actually Jim McManus, but uh, mm -hmm. to the public, Jim McKay is your father. Tell us how that made life uh, complicated, given your decision to to enter into the world of sports broadcasting. Well, it's a good question, and he was uh, a renowned broadcaster, uh, most famous for his coverage of the Olympic um, hostage tragedy at the 1972 Olympics. And he, you know, started at a time in the early 60s when there were only three broadcast networks. There was no Fox, there was no ESPN, uh, there was no Fox Sports. Um, it was a very small little industry, really. And he and a group of men and women started a show called Wide World of Sports, which was as much a travel log as it was a sports show. And they would do sports that literally had never been seen widely in the US, whether it was track and field or gymnastics or swimming and diving or skiing. Um, and it became an incredibly well-known show. Um, people still come up to me in airports um, or when they know who I am and they say, um, your dad was Jim McKay. Um, we listen to your dad every Saturday with my, with my dad in our homes at five o'clock every Saturday, we tuned in to see what it was gonna be. Uh, so it was a great life for me. I got to travel with him to many events, uh, Indianapolis 500s and U.S. Open golfs and uh, British Opens and, um, you know, world figure skating championships, all sorts of great events around the world. And he would leave pretty much every Thursday and come back on Sunday night or Monday morning from a great sporting event and tell us stories and involve me in his work as much as he could, took me as much as he could when I wasn't in school. So it was a great way to grow up. It was taxing on my mom and my family a little bit because he was away so very much. And his schedule was up in the air. He literally got a call um, one day, it was on a uh, Wednesday from Rune Arledge, who was the executive producer of the show. And he said, Jim, we just bought Australian rules football, um, book yourself on a flight to Sydney. So the next you know, morning he was on a flight to Sydney 
and we were going on a vacation once uh, with my family to go skiing and he got a call on a Thursday morning saying, I want you to come down to Florida to Cypress Gardens for the World um, uh, Water Ski Championships. So we went down to Cypress Gardens instead of going skiing. So it was an interesting life. Um, it was great that my dad was home during most of the week so that he could go to my football and baseball and basketball games, many of which took place uh, midweek. So it was, a, it was a great way to grow up. And I think I was bitten by the sports television bug at a very early age. And it stayed with me until my, I'm 65 years old now. So it stayed with me obviously until now. But my mom did a great job in many ways, you know, being the father and the mother for four or five days a week since my dad was away. But he made up for it for the time he was um, at home. And um, all in all, it was a great way to grow up. And my father has, you know, an impeccable reputation, both as a broadcaster and as a human being. So that obviously with me going into the business helped. Um, I started out at ABC Sports, um, which was logical since that's where my dad was. After a couple of years, it became kind of obvious to me that I was either going to get a better break or a worse break from some of the people there just because my dad was such a big influence there. And I decided to go work for two men, Don Omeyer and Jeffrey Mason, who were two leaders at ABC Sports who went over to NBC Sports uh, to revitalize their division. They had won the rights to the 1980 Moscow Olympics. So I suddenly left um, you know, on really good terms and went to work at a network where my father was not a major force. And it was one of the best things I ever did because I got to be involved in production and programming and business affairs and on-air promotion. And it was really good for me to get away from my dad. The two years and the previous years at ABC Sports were great, but being my own man at NBC Sports um, was the right choice for me to make, Bill. Yeah. So tell, tell us, what it, you, you got bitten by the sports bug. What is it about sports that, that makes you uh, so enchanted? Uh, what, why is it so well, important to you? It, well, first of all, I love sports as a fan and I love television, um, not just sports television, all kind of television. So to be able to combine the two is great. Um, and if you talk to people like a, a Phil Sims or a Tony Romo, um, or, uh, you know, Clark Kellogg uh, or the great Duke basketball player who works with Jim Nance now, I'll, I'll think if I just, I drew, I drew a blank. But if you ask them, they'll say to you, the closest thing to being an athlete is doing a live television show. You can't make a mistake. Everything is immediate. You're being watched by millions of people. If you make a mistake, everybody's going to know about it. So it's, it's just a, an exhilarating experience to be in a television truck, knowing that you're making hundreds and sometimes thousands of decisions in a three hour show, knowing that you can't make a mistake and knowing that uh, in, in some cases, upwards of 100 million people, uh, as in with the Super Bowl, 100 million people are watching what you do instantaneously. Um, there's no thrill like that, I think, other than, um, um, other than being a, an athlete and being in, a, in a, um, uh, you know, a sporting event. And I knew I wasn't going to be a professional athlete. So this was about the closest to that kind of uh, Grant Hill, by the way, is the, the person I was, I was thinking about. But Grant will tell you the same thing. Um, it's just it's a great way to make a living. And when you're not doing live television, I, I'm lucky that I'm in management as well as production, you get to have relationships with the people at Augusta National or the people at the NFL um, or the SEC or the NCAA. So you're, you're, you're half your life is sort of nurturing relationships, doing deals, buying rights to great sporting events, um, programming great sporting events. And the rest of the time being responsible for them, you know, on a, on a live or even, even a tape delay basis, which can be exhilarating also. So it's the variety that I have in my life to go, as an example, when in the pre, uh, pre pandemic days where we would do the final four on a Saturday night and the championship game on a Monday night, and then literally Tuesday morning, uh, go down to Augusta National to do the Masters. Now, if you say to any, sports fan or non-sports fan, you get to go to the final four and be a part of that production and then go and spend five days 
um, in Augusta covering the Masters, you know, if you if you were to raffle that off in one of these big charity dinners, you'd get a lot of money. So that's why I, I, I reconfirm that when I think about retirement, I think about sitting home and watching the Masters of the Final Four and thinking you could have been part of that again. So it's um, that's why it's as I said, Bill, it's so intoxicating and it's so addicting. Um, it's just the it's the best way in the world to make a living. Yeah. So what what have you learned about the the, the leadership challenge? You, you talked about this is really high pressure, high stakes as you're doing a live event. You know how how have you learned how to bring out the best from people where they're they're not just in total fear of making a mistake, uh, but instead give you give you their best uh, under a lot of pressure. Well, that's a really good question. Um, you know, I've been fortunate that I've always had a great team around me. Um, I, and, and it's been more than fortunate in that in many cases, I selected that team. Um, I've run always a complete and total meritocracy. Um, I don't care if you're male or female or black or white or short or tall. Um, if you're the right person for the job, you'll get a job and you'll do well at, when I was at NBC Sports, it was the same thing. When I was at you know, IMG working for Mark McCormick, it was the same thing. And it's the same thing running CBS Sports. Um, I have never put up with politics around the office. Um, I have never played favorites. Um, I have always made sure that the people I hire are good people and honest people with integrity who get along with other people. And I've had the best group of people working around me and, and each one has been better than the last. And at CBS Sports, everybody knows that we are demanding. You gotta be totally committed to your job. Yes, personal life is extremely important. And we stress that. We encourage people to bring their families on events or bring them into the studio. But when you're working, we expect, and I expect complete commitment from you towards your job. And I don't want somebody talking badly about one of their coworkers to try to get ahead. And I, I'm really fortunate in saying that there is really no politics, no backstabbing. It is a really good place to work at CBS Sports. And if you were to ask people, um, they would say, I believe the exact same thing. Um, I don't read a lot of business how-to books, to be honest with you. I read some of them and I find some of them very um, educational. But I've done a lot of this just kind of by gut, um, you know, gut approach and trying to instinctively know who are the right people for the right jobs, encouraging people, um, letting them know the ground rules, which is I never want to be surprised. Over communicating is better than under communicating. Um, I want total transparency. I don't want any hidden agendas. Uh, there's no pride of authorship. If if a um, if a production assistant comes to me and says, can I have 10 minutes of your time and has a great idea for a show or a profile or an opening or a piece of music, I say, great. And I say, call up the producer, tell him we've talked, sell the idea to him. And if he buys it, I love it. So, um, you know, I've never felt that a hierarchy is a good thing. Um, everybody knows I'm the boss and I get treated like the boss, which is good but I don't try to um, intimidate anybody. And when you're in a live situation, um, do I get upset when people make mistakes? I do get upset. Um, is there sometimes some cross words that are exchanged? Yes, there are some cross words that, that are exchanged in the um, all in the effort of doing a better show and learning and going forward. And after the show is over, um, and I'm fortunate that most of the shows that I'm associated with are, are really good shows and good productions, you know, you high five each other and the men and women come together and you sometimes do a toast if it's a big show like the Super Bowl. And it's, you know, it's a great feeling and, and camaraderie, I think is important. And if, um, you know, if, if, if I have people who are working for me who aren't excited about coming to work every day, and I know that sometimes you're in the minority if you're excited about coming to your work, not everybody is that lucky. Um, even if you get paid a lot of money, you're sometimes, you know, it's a drag and day after day, there's a monotony to it. There's no monotony to sports television, um, but I want people to enjoy their jobs. And if they're not enjoying their jobs, you know, I don't want them working there. Um, I've had re remarkably, once I put my team in place at CBS Sports, remarkably low turnover. Um, pretty much 
Um, everybody has stayed. Um, a few people have been um, asked to leave, very, very few and far between. Uh, many have been promoted. Um, almost my entire senior staff, half of which um, is, uh, is women, um, started at a much lower um, position in the company and worked their way up. I'm not a big believer in hiring a, a big outside gun to come in. I believe very strongly in promoting from within because that builds loyalty. It shows that uh, there's an opportunity and a pathway for people to move forward. And I think it's the right way to run an organization. Uh, so I, I have enormous affection for the people with whom I work. And they, I would say to them, to a man and to a woman, um, I would go into battle with them any day. And I do go into battle with them on rights negotiations or big, you know, we're planning the Super Bowl right now in, the, um, in a pandemic, which is not easy. We'll have 700 people there, maybe fewer this year than we normally do, but approximately 700 people, all of whom will need to get tested and screened and some quarantined. Just think about that. Um, that's an entire miniature city that is gonna descend on Tampa that has to be kept safe, social distancing, PPE, you know, all the stuff that we're doing, uh, you know, not going to restaurants, not going to gyms, all the stuff that people are being asked to do on a personal basis and a professional basis, uh, six or 700 people have to do that for seven or eight days in Tampa, Florida. So it's, it's gonna be a Super Bowl unlike anyone we've ever produced. So I, I want to come back to some of these specific challenges of the, the pandemic. But uh, before I move on from how you build your teams, um, it, it, it's clear that family has been very important to you, both as a son and as a father. Um, and it's been said about you that you bring family values into the workplace. What, what exactly does that mean, that, that you bring family values and, and build a culture around family values? Uh, that's another really good question. Um, one of the sayings my dad said to me often is that the camera never lies. It can spot a phony every time. And he was speaking more of people in front of the camera, but it's true of people behind the camera also. Um, people know if you're a phony, um, they can sense it. And it doesn't mean you're not gonna be successful. There are a lot of phonies who do you know, really well up to a point. I don't think they reach the absolute pinnacle of their professions, but they can do pretty well. You can be fast talkers or be, you know, a flim flam man. And you can, you can do pretty well if you think on your feet well and you bring a lot of money into a company. Um, but I, 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 I believe really strongly in the values that my mother and father gave me and honesty and integrity are two of the biggest ones. And in this business, if you're not honest and you don't have integrity, people know that. And you might do a, a good deal for your company by cutting a corner or taking advantage of somebody. But in the end, integrity um, and honesty uh, rule the day. And I, I try to impart that on people who work for me. I think they feel it kind of instinctively from the men and women who work at, um, at CBS Sports. And I make it very clear that um, there's a certain kind of behavior, and I don't mean to sound like, um, um, you know, too Pollyannish about it, but there's a standard of excellence and there's a standard of honesty and integrity that we insist upon, and it's non-negotiable. And I, I can't think of an example, um, certainly at CBS Sports, I probably could if I went back in my entire career, but I can't think of an example at CBS Sports um, where I have said to somebody, um, that is not an honest way to behave. I've talked to people sometimes about their behavior um, and their, their attitude sometimes. That can get a little bit out of whack. But in terms of the fundamentals of morality and integrity, it just hasn't been an issue because I, I don't stand for it. And when you see somebody who doesn't stand for it, um, it becomes obvious. And I want no part of that person in my organization. I don't care. I mean, you can be by far the best director um, in the business and wanna work for CBS Sports. But if you're not um, a man or a woman of integrity and if you abuse people, you know, you're not gonna work on our team. So and if you don't treat people with respect um, always, whether they're the chairman of the company or whether they're uh, the chairman's assistant, 
if you don't treat those people with respect, you are not going to be at CBS Sports. I can promise you that. So uh, you've you've uh, been at other places before uh, arriving at CBS. So for our viewers, this is something that they're going to face uh, as a question and a challenge throughout their careers, which is when do I make a move? And so you told us about one of your, your earliest moves, which was to, to leave, uh, leave ABC. But as you think about some of the other moves you made in your career, walk us, walk us through the, the decision making around why did you choose this is the time to, to take a new opportunity. Well, uh, deciding to leave or being asked to leave is obviously, if you have a profession and you have a background and a job, is it can be traumatic, it can be life interrupting, it can be financially um, troubling. Um, it is a major decision and one that is not to be taken lightly. Um, through good fortune or just luck, every move I made was the best possible move I could have made. When I left ABC, I worked for two men who basically said to me, you can do whatever you want at NBC Sports. You can do programming, you can do production, um, you can do rights negotiations, whatever you want to do. And I did everything. I did talent development. I was in charge of on-air promotion, in charge of the boxing department, in charge of their wide world of sports called NBC Sports World. Um, I, as I said, was involved in, in, in the, the promos that we did. I got to do anything I wanted to do. And I did, I think, a good enough job that I kept getting promoted. And I was having a great career at NBC Sports. GE had just bought NBC. I, I was getting to know the GE people. And then I ran into Mark McCormick, um, who I knew a little bit. Um, he is the, literally the creator of sports marketing and the sports marketing industry. And if you haven't read his first book, he's written a lot of books, but it's called What They Don't Teach You at Harvard Business School. It's a must read for anybody, I think, in, in, uh, who wants to go into the world of business. But I was with Mark at Wimbledon, and he said to me, you have a great job at NBC. You can be there for the rest of your career. But I've got an opportunity that's a once in a lifetime opportunity, and it's to help run the biggest division at International Management Group, which was the television division called Transworld International, uh, the largest producer, largest independent producer of sports programming in the world. IMG was by far the biggest sports marketing company in the world with offices in you know, 30 different countries and all over the world. It was so big and it was so powerful. And Mark said, TWI is the, um, is the biggest division. It's growing from, you know, 40 to 50% a year. And Barry Frank, who's running it now, needs a number two, and you can run it one day. So I took a real leap of faith, and I left a very comfortable job being at, um, uh, you know, head of programming at NBC Sports. I could have been there for my career, had a great pension, everything was great. And I left to really... Um, to really be a, um, um, you know, an entrepreneur and work for Mark representing sports instead of buying sports for the network, I was representing sports and I was, um, um, you know, representing everybody from John Madden to the Olympics to NBA basketball to the NFL. And my job was to go out and find new properties, represent current properties, and do the best job that I could working for Mark McCormick. It was, as I said, very entrepreneurial. I didn't have the, the, um, the infrastructure that I had at NBC, but it was an amazing nine years. And I learned how to be a salesman. I learned how to sell events instead of buy events. And it was a, an amazing nine years. I learned as much from Mark McCormick and Barry Frank as I have from anybody. And I thought I was gonna be there the rest of my life, the rest of my career. I was just so happy. And I just signed a new contract with Mark for three more years at IMG in uh, 1996 and uh, in the summer of 96. And I said, listen, Mark, um, the only non-compete clause I want in my contract and the only opportunity that I would ever pursue, I'm never gonna work for anybody but you and Barry. The only opportunity I'd like to pursue if, and I said, it probably will never come along, but it's to run a, um, a network sports division. And he said, listen, if you get that opportunity, I would never stand in your way. And this was in the middle to the, the middle of August. 
Well, in October, I got a call from a man named Peter Lund, who was running uh, the CBS television network, who I knew a little bit. And he offered me the job to run CBS Sports. And, you know, he had a meeting with me at breakfast. And then he said, think about it and come back and let me know next week if you want the job. And I came back and I said, I'm all in on a couple conditions. Uh, number one, uh, you and Westinghouse, who had bought um, CBS a little while before that, you and Westinghouse are truly committed to sports and you're going to try to get the NFL back and try to renew our major properties. And number two, that you let me run the division because I know some people at CBS Sports who I think I, I would want to make a change with. And as long as I have those two conditions, um, I'm on. And he said, well, don't you want to know what I'm going to pay you? And I said, I do, I'd like to know that. I said, you're gonna pay me um, a lot of money and I know that and if I do well, I'll make a lot more money, but I have never made a, um, a career move for money based on money. And I said, we'll, we'll agree and compromise and negotiate a fair salary. I know you're gonna be fair with me, but I'm not doing this for the money. So that is you know, some advice I would give people um, you know, not to, um, uh, not to make a, jo a job change just for money. Because if you don't love your job and if you're not challenged by your job, it really doesn't matter um, how much money you're being paid. And if you're doing it for money, the chances are, I don't know what the chances are, but th there's a good chance that the job's not gonna work out. I know a lot of people who have left jobs that they love for a lot of money in a different profession or a different area or different company and it just doesn't uh, just hasn't worked out for them. So I made the career moves I made and everyone worked out well. I never thought I was going to leave except ABC. I, I kind of thought I was perhaps going to leave that. But when I was in my current jobs, I never thought I was going to leave and never had any desire to leave until a better opportunity came along. And I will also say that the people I left at ABC, at NBC and at IMG were incredibly supportive of me leaving. Um, you know, I, um, they realized it was an opportunity they couldn't give me and it was the right thing for me to do. And I remember when, uh, when I went in to tell Mark McCormick I was leaving, uh, I said, listen, Mark, I'm, you know, I'm not gonna leave you in the lurch. I will stay as long as it's necessary for a smooth transition. I'll help you hire the person who's gonna replace me. You know, I'm gonna give you a, a very nice period of time um, for you to make this transition. And I said, what do you think is a fair amount of time? And I thought he was gonna say, you know, maybe six weeks, two months, something like that. He said, I don't know, six to eight months. And I said, Mark, I can't, I can't give you that. But I ended up giving him uh, three months actually, um, which, which I thought was the right thing to do. And I wanted to leave on good terms. And I knew I was gonna do a lot of business with Mark McCormick in the future because he represented a lot of our talent, including Jim Nance and, Greg Gumbel and um, Bob Costas and a lot of people who are heavyweights in the um, in the industry. So I knew I'd be negotiating with IMG in the future. So I wanted to make sure I left on really good terms. Yeah. So one uh, one detour or uh, kind of additional activity that you took on uh, during this very distinguished career is you're one of only two people to ever simultaneously head up uh, sports and news. And so uh, for, I think, a five-year period, uh, you, you were actually running CBS News in addition to CBS Sports. So th this was, uh, if I have the dates wrong, I apologize, but I think 2006 to, to 2010 or... or yeah, I was, uh, I was called into my boss's office in um, um, the fall of 2005. And I knew that CBS News had its share of problems. Um, and I always thought in the back of my mind, wouldn't it be nice to do something that only one other person had ever done? And it was Rune Arledge. And it was to simultaneously run a sports division and a news division at a broadcast network. So my boss, Leslie Moonbis at the time, brought me into his office and said, um, and he didn't call me into his office very often. We, we talked on the phone every day, but a face-to-face -face meeting was, was kind of unusual. And he said, who's your mentor and role model um, in your life other than your dad? And I said, of course, I said, you are. And he said, no, answer honestly. And I said, well, it's Rune Arledge. 
And I knew at that point what was going to happen. And he said, um, what has Rune Arledge done that you haven't done? And I said, I got you. I know he's run a news division. And he said, what do you think? I said, I want to think about it. And I want to talk to my wife and my family about it because it's going to be a major um, uh, shift in my lifestyle. I said, but listen, I work for you and I work for CBS and I'm loyal to you and I'm loyal to CBS. And if you ask me to do this, um, I don't see how I can turn it down. But I said, give me a night to think about it and we'll, we'll talk again in the morning. And I talked to my wife and she said, if you want to do this, I'll support you. Um, I'm hoping you still carve out time for your family, which I certainly did during my job. But it's a, you know, it's a, an, 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 uh, an incredibly once in a lifetime opportunity. So you ought to do it. So I, you know, said to my boss that I would do it. And I realized that the only, there are really only two reasons. And I gave, I gave a town hall meeting um, shortly after I took the role as president of, of CBS News. And the first question came from um, Ed Bradley, who, if you might remember, if you're a 60 Minutes fan, was one of the legendary 60 Minutes interviewers, maybe, maybe one of the best in history, certainly one of the best in history. And he asked the first, <clears throat> the first question of me, <clears throat> and he said, could you have turned down this job? And I said, I had only have two reasons to turn down the job. One, I don't want to work hard, or I don't want to work a lot harder, which is not really a good reason. And number two, I think that CBS Sports, or excuse me, CBS News is beyond saving, and it's in such bad shape that, that I can't save it. Not that it needs saving necessarily, but it needs re reinvigorating. And I said, I don't believe either one of those two things. I think CBS News is well positioned for the future. We've got to make a lot of changes, but I, I feel good about um, you know, leading this division. And I realized that there were a lot of similarities between CBS News and CBS Sports and a lot of dissimilarities. You know, the similarities are it's, it's about covering big events, whether it's a Super Bowl or an election or, um, you know, tragically a school shooting um, or a terrorist attack. You're, you're covering major stories and storytelling is at the heart of both sports television and news television. So that was one. Um, and I felt I had a good sense of storytelling. Um, number two, it's developing talent. And whether it's uh, a Tony Romo or a Jim Nance or a um, Katie Couric, who was our anchor for a while, or Nora O'Donnell um, or um, Scott Pelley, it's developing and nurturing and putting talent in the right places um, to succeed. And it's about managing a, a big division and leading and you know, managing a you know, multi-million dollar budget, um, you know, having the sense to you know, be a leader, developing all the same kind of people that I had developed at CBS Sports. So I took the job and it was challenging and uh, I made some mistakes along the way, but I think I left CBS News in a better place than when I, uh, than when I joined it. Um, it was very taxing on me and my family because I wanted to get into the office in the morning before our morning show started at seven o'clock. And I wanted to be there for the evening news every night at, at uh, 6.30. So I you know, left the home at my home at you know, 5.30 or earlier and left the office usually at seven o'clock. Um, tried to spend one or two nights a week in the city. So I wasn't commuting like crazy, but it was a tough, it was a tough lifestyle, but it was very rewarding. I'm glad I did it. Five and a half years was just about the right amount of time to do it. I think doing it any longer would not have been good for my health or my family. Um, and when I got the job, Howard Stringer, who went on to run um, all of CBS, um, who, who ran CBS News at one time, you know, called me up and said, congratulations, um, I speak from experience, do the job for between five and six years and then get out because that's as long as your, your mind and your body and your family can, can withstand it. So, but it was a great, you know, I got to cover two Obama, um, uh, no, one Obama election, excuse me, um, uh, which was incredibly rewarding. Um, I got to, um, you know, lead the coverage on the war in Iraq, which was taxing and depressing at times and scary at times. But we had a lot of other, you know, major stories, the big oil spill uh, down off the coast of Louisiana, which took, you know, 
two months to clean up. So there were many, and there were a lot of positive stories also that we got to cover. So it was uh, it was different than sports, but it was similar in some ways. And it was um, it was just a period of my career that I take uh, I take great pride in. So uh, people have have very much missed sports in, in the midst of this pandemic, where. Uh, we're, we're witnessing so much tragedy and trauma. Uh, people have missed their ability to escape through, through the world of sports. So tell us what, what have been some of your biggest challenges in, in dealing with the pandemic and, and the inability uh, to, to easily, easily put on uh, live sports programming? Well, it's been obviously uh, disruptive. The NCAA basketball championship, which is one of our biggest events was canceled three days or two days before selection Sunday. That was disruptive. The masters was postponed from April until the second weekend in November. You know, that was disruptive. Uh, we were gonna have the Alabama LSU game uh, following the masters on Sunday in November. That's been moved to no, uh, December 5th now. We've had numerous college basketball games already postponed or canceled, numerous college football games outside of the SEC that have been uh, uh, canceled or postponed. So it's been, that part has been very disruptive and very financially um, painful for us. But the other challenge, which is even greater, is figuring out how to cover these events in a safe way. Um, we, uh, for our golf, we were the first network to come back with major sports coverage with our golf tour in, in early June. Um, we had three separate production teams uh, for each golf tournament we did. One in the truck that was the main production team, one back at the hotel in case somebody got infected in the truck with uh, COVID and one back in New York in a mobile unit and a studio who could produce the event remotely. Um, you can imagine how complicated that was. Everybody came in three or four days early so that they could quarantine. Everybody on the crew was tested and screened. Um, everybody on the crew had to social distance. So we literally brought in additional uh, mobile units so that people could be six feet apart. So in a normal mobile unit configuration, in two of the sections, you would probably have a total of 15 people or 16 people. We now had six people and more trucks. So it was enormously, I, I can't express how complicated it was. It was by far the most complicated production any of us had ever done far exceeding anything to do with the Super Bowl or the Final Four or the Masters, just trying to figure out how to safely protect our people and have them um, respect all the protocols and procedures was amazingly complex. We did it, we pulled it off, we spent a lot of money, we're still spending a lot of money on NFL football. Everybody on the crew is tested before they show up to work uh, they arrive at the hotel, they're tested that night or the following morning, um, everybody. And each we do up to six or seven NFL games a weekend. And there are anywhere from 60 to 70 people on most of the crews. Every one of those crews in every city that they're in has to be tested every single week. We have an entire company called MedCorp who is working for us, administering all the tests and all the protocols. Everybody's got to wear PPE. Uh, you can't go from your mobile unit to another mobile. You got to stay in your work area. If you're an announcer, you go from the hotel to the stadium to the booth, and then you go back to the hotel. I mean, you don't uh, have production dinners, which we used to have. Um, you don't have production meetings in person. You don't meet with the coaches in person. Everything is done virtually. So, I, you know, I hope I've given you an idea of how incredibly challenging this period has been and it's been going on now uh, since March and you know our people are in a pressure cook pressure cooker and are extremely extremely uh, worn out and tired and we've still got the rest of the NFL season the college football season and we've got a Super Bowl and we've got golf starting in January again so it's it's really taxing and it has uh, it, it's it's enabled people and CBS sports to show their true metal and their true talent and commitment to, uh, to this division and to the sports world.
So, so given, given this pressure cooker, all these challenges, all the fatigue, what, what have you learned about yourself as a leader um, during this incredibly difficult time? You know, just that you've got to be appreciative of what people are doing. You've got to be really um, um, willing to be very, very flexible. And you've, excuse me, you've got to totally trust the people who are working for you. If my operations person is a lady named Patty Power, who runs our operations um, group, you know, says to me, we need three additional people to fly to Pittsburgh for the game uh, because we have a potential contact tracing with someone who has symptoms. I say to her, go ahead, do it. It's your job. I don't, I don't need to approve that. You go ahead and do that. I, I'm glad I know informationally, but that's not my job. I've had to rely on everybody in my division at all levels more than I ever have. And they've all stepped up, as I said, big time and all done a really, really good job. Um, and being appreciative is really important. If you've got somebody who's literally wearing a mask in a control room for 12 hours uh, from seven in the morning to seven o'clock at night or from noon to midnight, you know, you gotta figure out a way to thank that person, whether they're an assistant or whether they're an executive producer. So that's been really important. And, um, you know, just trying to keep my perspective. You know, um, I hated that the, uh, the March Madness was canceled. Um, that was heartbreaking for me and for a lot of people, heartbreaking for our division. Um, it was heartbreaking not to do the masters in April. Um, but I've learned to, you know, go with the punches and realize that, you know, the problems I'm dealing with pale in comparison to problems other people are dealing with. You know, I've been very lucky. Um, you know, no one I'm close to has been affected um, by COVID-19. Um, you know, I'm lucky that I still have a job. Uh, I'm lucky that, you know, my, you know, work hasn't been um, more disruptive than it has been. I'm lucky that I get to work at home um, and do my job from, you know, my home instead of, instead of, you know, somewhere else or not being able to do my job. So I got to keep a perspective in that, you know, I wake up in the morning and say, oh, Jesus, we got to worry about the Alabama LSU game. Well, there are a lot of people in this country that are worrying about, you know, parents that they can't see because they're infected, um, um, you know, with COVID-19. So got to keep my perspective. I'm still, I, I still think I'm the luckiest person in the world to have the job that I have. It's a little more difficult than it's, than it's probably ever been. Um, but that's, um, that problem pales in comparison to what other people are dealing with in this country. And I got to keep my perspective in that, uh, in that and be very appreciative of the job people are doing around me. So as we as we finish out this uh, this session, uh, can you can you share any words with our viewers to give them a, a sense of optimism and hope uh, in in this very challenging environment? You know, I think we're going to get through it um, as a country and as a nation and as families and as coworkers. Um, I think it's probably, if you listen to all the experts, it's going to get worse before it gets better, but we're going to get a vaccine and we're going to get a therapeutic treatment one day. And people will look back at this um, the way they do a little bit, um, and I don't want to overstate the case, but a little bit like 9-11 um, in that our lives are never going to be uh, the same after this event as they were before that event. Um, and whether you were directly affected um, by someone who was, was um, involved in 9-11 or not, your perspective on the world will never be the same. And um, many people were touched by it in a very personal way. And, um, um, you know, you'll never forget it. It's the same thing with the pandemic. So many people have been uh, personally affected. It is disrupted. Um, you know, I talk about disrupting um, the masters. Well, what about disrupting the millions of businesses and small businesses around the world who have literally been disruptive and probably won't come back? So there are so many people who have been so adversely affected by this pandemic. Um, and I think the only light at the tunnel, I would say, is that as I started off by saying, we're going to come back. We're a very strong nation. Uh, we're going to rebuild the businesses, hopefully, that have been lost. Many of them, if not most of them, will be rebuilt. And we'll, uh, we'll look back on this probably in a number of years and think, wow, uh, we got through it. 
our country is still strong. Um, our family is still strong, but boy, it was no fun and it was really, really hard. Uh, but these things test people's uh, mettle and they test their endurance and they test their faith, um, which I think is, you know, increasingly, in, listen, I mean, there's um, um, no doubt that a person's faith um, is, is even more challenged and even more important towards times like this. But I would try to look at the bright side. I would try to look at the fact that, you know, you're still being educated at Duke University. Um, you still have um, you have access to the best minds in the uh, in the world. Um, you're fortunate in that um, you have you can afford a a laptop or a desktop or an iPad or an iPhone to be able to watch this. Um, and you're going to get through it. And um, you're going to hopefully end up in a job and in, in a number of years that you that you like. And you're gonna be able to tell your kids and your grandkids, here's what we went through it um, with COVID-19 and the pandemic. And um, you know, here's, here's how we got through it. And we're hopefully a better country and a better, uh, better group of people than we were before it. But don't lose faith, um, we're gonna get through it. Thank you so much, Sean, for, for being uh, an incredible role model and providing a sense of positivity and optimism. And also, thank you so much for sharing your time and your wisdom with our community. I thank you, and I'm envious. Um, my four years at Duke uh, were, in many ways, the best four years of my life. I'm envious that you get to, uh, even though it's un under different circumstances, and I know very different conditions. But um, you're lucky, and um, you know, don't be afraid to appreciate um, all you have going for you, because um, to be involved in this school is truly a blessing. Thank you so much. Bill, thank you very much and thank you to the students.